Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to week 16 of Wikibam Get Your Property Questions Answered webinars. Uh, I'm super excited that you guys are here again with us another week uh, into this, and we're heading towards the festive time of the year, wherever you are in the UK. Uh, I hope that you're, it's something you can look forward to. I hope it's very much a time uh, where you can uh, reflect, shall we say, on the course of the last tw uh, 12 months, which has been uh, very hectic, uh, certainly in the property world and subject to a lot of change. And I know uh, from personal experience that sometimes Christmas can be uh, a difficult time for a lot of people. Um, there is the, uh, and I speak from personal experience here, there is the kind of uh, John Lewis version of Christmas, if you like, where everything's rosy and happy and the family get together and it's wonderful and everybody you know, buys one another expensive gifts. And um, you know people feel very much as though you know it's a wonderful time of the year to be together with everybody and then there is the other end of the scale uh and you may or may not have seen uh, a video doing the rounds on social media which uh, has been labeled i think the um almost anti john lewis uh advert if you like or christmas advert and it can be a time of great um uh, distraction it can be a time of great sadness it can be a time of uh, a lot of mixed emotion a lot of uh, different feelings for a lot of people um, so I hope that whatever this time of the year is for you, um, as I say, it gives you a chance to reflect on the course of the last 12 months. And I also want to encourage you to do what's right for you during the course of the uh, Christmas period. Um, personally, I've had uh, quite a few Christmases in the past where, because relationships haven't been all that great with family, I've chosen to uh, spend it on my own. And I'll be honest, they've been some of the happiest Christmases I've ever had. Um, me and the dog, which was uh, the last couple of years, has been uh, fantastic uh, just to go out and have a really, really nice walk in the fresh Christmas air, talk to people, you know, out and about walking their dogs, go home, cook a little bit of food, uh, and not have to go through the huge anticlimax of this huge build up to Christmas. And then, you know, everything is over in a day, and then it's back to the, the grind uh, a few days later. So, I just want to encourage you to do whatever's right for you. If it's spending Christmas on your own and being okay with that, I'm going to encourage you to do that. If it's, um, you know, forcing you into a position where you've got to spend it with people that you don't want to spend it with, I'm going to encourage you to be selfish and do what's right for you. If that means pulling away from that group and being on your own, uh, 100% go and do that. Uh, as I say, that's happened to me in the past several times, and it's uh, brought me a great deal of satisfaction to do what I want to do rather than you know, what's expected. Uh, and alternative, of course, if you've got great family around you and uh, good friends and you want to spend time with them and have a lovely time, then fantastic. Please feel free to do that. Uh, I, I've also found that um, just as a quick share, and I'm not going to share exactly what I have done in the past because I'm not one of these, I'm not a believer in, you know, being one of these people that just takes their phone when they're handing somebody a £20 note in the street and just films it all. I don't believe in any of that. And I don't believe in telling the world stuff that you've done for uh, charity but I do believe that uh, you know there's a couple of suggestions that uh, one of the things you might want to consider is uh, taking a couple of uh, toys maybe to the local children's hospital uh, and um, taking them with some wrapping paper and uh, you know let the, let the staff know what presents you brought in can be a, a really nice thing to do uh, just because I think you know it's at that time of the year if kids are in hospital over Christmas it can be a very uncomfortable time for them particularly their families um for them so for them to wake up with a, a gift on Christmas day I think is a lovely thing to do uh that's just my take maybe you go to a soup kitchen or do something of those uh, along those lines would be uh, also a really nice thing to do as well so however you decide to spend your Christmas period I hope you have a wonderful time doing that um we've got a lot to do still before the uh, Christmas break and before the uh, new year is upon us and one of the things that we announced last week, uh, if you didn't catch our webinar last week, I did a crazy, crazy thing. And I actually announced that we were doing a £50,000 giveaway equivalent thereof um, within Wigiwam. And what we are going to do was to offer 10 free places on our 12-week roadmap training, which is designed to make your business an additional 20% of revenue uh, over the course of the next 90 days. Uh, that is um, something that I decided to do uh, almost on a bit of a whim, because um, uh, I believe that businesses are struggling or certainly will begin to struggle as we enter the new year. And I think uh, businesses need a lot of support. And so for me, you know, Christmas is a, is a time of giving. And I am open to giving that to people who uh, are open to the idea of receiving as well. That That is also something I've realized from coaching a lot of people 
is that uh, a lot of people um, do struggle to actually accept really great things into their life and do and to accept help and support. So, you know, some people uh, might uh, feel that for whatever reason, they don't think that I've got much value to add to their business. And that's okay. Because, you know, a lot of you just see this uh, perhaps cute looking guy uh, sitting at his computer, answering a few questions every week. But uh, I just wanted to share a couple of stories of things that have happened in the past uh, where I've coached and helped and mentored uh, different business owners with their uh, personal transformations and helped them with their uh, getting what they wanted out of life. Um, one story that sprang to mind earlier today when I was reflecting on this was there was a, a couple that first came to me and they wanted to build a property portfolio. And I sat down with them and I said, can you tell me what your goal is with property? What do you want to, where do you want to get to? What do you want to do? And uh, quick as a flash, the guy said, yeah, I want to build a 10 million pound property portfolio within 10 years. Okay. And I thought, okay, well, that's a fairly noble goal. Uh, let's have a look at where you're starting from. Okay. So they presented all their financials and we started looking at them and took a bit of a, a, a sort of look beneath the bonnet, if you like, of their financial situation. And one of the things I noticed was that uh, they were not in a, in a good position financially. And that's fairly okay. We, you know, we, that's what we expect when people come to uh, the investment arena, if you like, and they want to build a better life, then I can understand that sometimes their finances may not align or they might need a bit of help and support. Um, but this particular couple were actually on the verge of going bankrupt. And um, I just looked at their figures and I was like, okay, but, you know, great goal, but you do realize that you're, you know, very close to bankruptcy. And they looked at me like, what, what, what? I said, look, you know, here's your here's your liabilities. This is how much is going out every single month. This is how much is coming in. Uh, and this is your liabilities. And and these are, you know, where you stand with your credit cards and your payments and your timeframes and all the rest of it. I said, I can see this uh, coming to a very abrupt ending unless you get things sorted out straight away. And within, uh, I think at that time, we were working together for about eight weeks it could could have been longer might have been 90 days um and this guy went hell for leather trying to turn things around and and within 90 days he did uh he shifted a lot of um uh, liabilities off his uh, balance sheets as it were uh, uh, legally and professionally shall we say and uh, also found ways to generate additional income to support his uh, outgoings and all the rest of it because uh, that was one of the things that was killing them was um, a lack of income and uh, you know a huge amount of outgoings and the important point of the story was that unbelievably, uh, his wife was actually a financial advisor. Okay, and having looked at the numbers and the, and their financial statements, they couldn't see that they were in that difficult position. Okay, so I'm just showing that as a bit of a story. And on a personal note, um, the other story that I wanted to share with you was uh, probably about three years ago now, uh, prior to um, uh, COVID and all the rest of it, I was called in to help a, a civil engineering company. Now, this was quite an interesting story because it was an accountant that introduced me to them and said, look, they're in danger of going to the wall. Can you help them out? And I said, look, I'll willingly go in, spend a couple of weeks there, see what we can sort out, see what we can do to troubleshoot. And um, I don't know if you know much about civil engineering, but it's it's quite, um, how do I say, it? it's a very down to earth and quite rough and ready profession. You know, the guys are uh, straight talkers. They're used to dealing with the mud a lot and digging holes and, um you know, very, very straight talking. There's no BS in, in civils at all. So I went in um, and looked at their financial situation, why they were in such a, a difficult position. And I started to note, we had on the boardroom table, these stacks and stacks of invoices, right? That they've been sending out for all this work that they were doing. And in civil engineering work, what happens just to give you a bit of background is that uh, let's say there's a, an invoice that goes out for 10,000 pounds worth of work. It's a very it's uh, customary in the industry for a retention to be applied to that ten thousand pounds worth of work. So, the client might retain say five thousand uh, pounds, and that is on retention on the basis that within the, the uh, twelve months defects period, that if something happens to the quality of the work, if the let's say the tarmac deteriorates on the road that they, where they've done an infill, then the um, uh, contractor has the right to go back and redo that tarmac and then claim their five thousand pounds back and if they don't go back and redo the work then the client has that five thousand pounds to go back and get that work fixed okay or that error fixed and that's kind of how the industry works and it was introduced the, this retention element was introduced because there was a lot of civil firms that went bust um and, and left the client holding the bag as far as the cost of rectifying work that they'd already paid to have done and so uh, I was looking through the stacks of invoices and within um, three or four hours, I was like, okay, can can you guys help me here? Because these invoices had gone through 
uh, both directors, it was husband and wife firm, okay, both directors, uh, their financial uh, director as well, their accountant and the accountant's assistant had all gone through these invoices. And I sat there looking at them and I said, um, can you guys tell me like what's 5% or 73,000, whatever it is? And they went, oh, it's X, Y, Z, right? And I said, well, can you tell me why the client's holding on to 10% instead of five? And they're like, mm, okay, we don't know. We've missed that. And it wasn't just on one invoice. It was on loads of invoices, right? So what this company was actually doing, the reason why they were in such a mess was because they were actually going out, doing the work, and then instead of um, earning their 5% profit and having a 5% retention, um, which the client held, held on to, they were actually going out doing the work and the client was holding back 10% which was actually their uh, entire profit, um, which was actually sitting in other people's bank accounts. So they were running the firm on incredibly slim margins because that's how they felt a civil engineering business had to be run in order to try and be competitive and win work and all the rest of it. But not only that, all of their profit was sat in other people's bank accounts. And I'm just sitting there looking at this going, okay, guys, we've got no visibility on numbers whatsoever here. And so within... Uh, about a week, we got these big whiteboards up on the walls, and we were looking at the pipeline income that was coming in to the firm versus the outgoings and all the rest of it. And uh, the, the sad story, the sad part about the story was that after about uh, two months um, of looking at these numbers and looking at the pipeline, we came across a seventy thousand pound shortfall. And in order for the firm to carry on trading, um, they'd borrowed money to try and keep it going. They'd gone to, I think it was Funding Circle or somewhere like that to get some uh, funds to keep the firm going. And there was no visibility on the number side of things at all. And I'm not saying I'm an expert in the numbers. I'm really not, okay? But what I am saying is that sometimes a fresh pair of eyes coming into the business can really lend a, a different perspective. And so in this situation, as I say, there was no visibility there. Uh, there was a £70,000 shortfall that was coming up in their accounts. And the funny part of the story is that I spoke to the uh, director, who's this um, uh, yeah, civils guy, and, he, and we sat there in the in the boardroom and I said, okay, you've got a problem here because, you know, come May, you're 70,000 pounds in the hole and you've got no income. How are you going to bridge that gap? And he went, well, you'll have to put the money in. And I'm like, okay, for two weeks, I've been trying to sort out your company and I've been trying to sort out um, a, a revised structure in the business and all of my suggestions that I've put forward, you haven't taken on board. And in fact, you fought against me. And now when it comes to the crunch point, you want me to put my hand in my pocket pull out a 70,000 pound check and cover your losses, right? Because you're not listening to how the business perhaps should be run. And it's very difficult, obviously, to tell somebody how to run their business. Uh, I don't I'd subscribe to that view other than if somebody needs to be told, I will tell them. But if they don't choose to take that knowledge on board, that's up to them, right? Um, so I've gone from, uh, shall we say, I, I had a bit of, um, uh, well, a friend of mine pointed out that I have a bit of a savior complex where I wanted to try and save a lot of people from uh, hurting themselves financially or, or get, getting things wrong in business, where as now I realize that people have to make their own mistakes and they have to uh, sometimes learn the hard way. There's nothing you can do about that. But the point of me sharing all of that with you is to highlight that, you know, there's a, a reasonable amount of uh, skill and knowledge uh, tucked away up here somewhere and if that's something that appeals to you and that you want to take advantage of and some having a fresh pair of eyes coming into your business to look at it uh, over the course of 12 weeks and to really fast track your success because i think 2023 is going to be a really challenging year and particularly in estate agency and conveyancing it's going to be make or break for a lot of business i'm not going to beat about the bush it really is going to be make or break and i know that we'll, there will be many businesses that will make the wrong choices when it comes to how to financially manage the ship, if you like, to survive the year. And what I, what I think a lot of businesses will do is end up chopping staff numbers in order to reduce overhead. And they're focusing on the wrong element, which is, first of all, getting rid of their human um, resources, which is perhaps the most important thing and the most time consuming bit to build up in a business is to train somebody in the way that you do things around here. But secondly, they're focusing on the wrong thing. They're reducing expenses rather than focusing on building revenue. And that's the most important thing. And particularly where a market is slowing down, where the market is going to get harder to sell property, where it's going to get harder to convince clients that they should be spending more money on a higher fee or, you know, for conveyancing or a state agency. Uh, I think this is it's going to be a really challenging year. So if you are thinking that, you know, the next year holds some also a lot of opportunity because it does, and I don't want to be very clear about that, then uh, I would encourage you to join our um, £50,000 Christmas giveaway 
by sending me an email, happy to help at wiggywam.co.uk. That's happy to help at wiggywam.co.uk. And in the subject line, just put Christmas giveaway. Okay, Christmas giveaway. That's all you need to put in the subject line and just send that email in. Uh, everybody will go into a hat. We'll do the draw on uh, Christmas Day. Uh, I think that'll be a good time to do um, a bit of a draw. We're giving away 10 places. And as I say, over the course of 12 weeks, I'll hold your hand in building up your business and uh, stacking an additional 20% of revenue onto your business within 90 days. Okay, that's a promise. Um, we will, uh, well, it's actually a guarantee, not a promise. I'll make that happen. Um, the other thing I will say to you is that if you are, uh, not a business owner, but you like the sound of this and you think it could actually um, enhance your career, whether you are a, a plumber, uh, a sparky, whether you're a removals man or a woman, uh, whether you're a surveyor, conveyancer, estate agent, letting agent, or anybody that's connected with the property industry, then if you feel that actually you could get some uh, benefit out of this, then please reach out to me as well. You can join in uh, in the Christmas giveaway. Um, and if we draw your name out of the hat, you'll win the space and we'll work with you over the course of the next 12 weeks uh, to really uh, bolster your authority in the industry. And um, that uh, has a massive consequence in terms of your uh, demand, i.e. what employers will pay you to have the privilege of them of you working for them. OK, so it's open to everybody. Um, I'm not going to harp on about it. It's, it's there if you want it. Um, as I say, I'm, I'm not going to uh, try and push you or force you to join in. You either want it or you don't. It's a take it or leave it situation. Uh, we've kept the barrier to entry very, very low in terms of joining in. If you want to join in, uh, as I say, just send me an email. Happy to help at wigiwam.co.uk and put the subject line as Christmas giveaway. And uh, I'd be delighted to draw your name out of a hat, all being well on Christmas Day, uh, whilst we're enjoying a glass of port or something like that. All right. So that'll be fun. Uh, as I say, I'll leave it with you. It's up to you. If you want it, reach out, grab it with both hands. If you don't, again, no hard feelings. Uh, wishing you all the best of luck in 2023, whatever happens. Okay, right. So just want to give you that context, guys, before we kicked off today's uh, webinar, because it is important. We've had a few people reach out saying, what is this actually all about? Um, and I think in my enthusiasm last week, I just wanted to sort of make the announcement and, and get people involved, but I didn't really give you guys too much context. So if you've got that uh, understanding now, then hopefully that'll give us enough room to sort of move on and uh, get into a, into this week's questions. Question number one is coming from Kenny here. Hi there, Kenny. Thank you for your question and for being part of our amazing WiggyWam community. Uh, Kenny says, I have a number of properties, including one that needed doing up, which I recently sold. I got to know the new owner really well and was very impressed with what he'd done to it. We are in discussions about doing a couple of flips together as the standard of his work was impeccable. Uh, I'd cover the mortgage and leave him to renovate. When it's finished, I'd get the pre-renovated asking price and he keeps the rest. Firstly, is this a good or bad idea? If not, what is a better way of working? Also, would I be responsible for all solicitors and agency fees, energy bills, and so on? Is it me uh, if I take out the mortgage? Should I pay half the renovation costs or should we do everything 50-50 down the middle? Okay, Kenny, well, that's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, this is something I've seen uh, quite often in the property investor space. And it's something that we have, uh, so to say, recommended that people go down this road if they're struggling to build a property portfolio because they don't have a lot of cash initially. They can do a joint venture with a builder where the builder can go in and do the renovation works, excuse me, and they, they just uh, fund the purchase of that uh, property, okay? So it's something that it certainly is advantageous if you've got the right person to work with as a business partner. And the only way you're going to find this out, unfortunately, is just by doing a project, okay? So the one bit of advice I will give you, Kenny, and you must take this on board if you're going to do this, you must put everything in writing, okay? Decide what you're going to do, put it all in writing. So whether you, I would go and have a, a coffee with your uh, proposed colleague here and walk through a couple of hypothetical scenarios with the projects that you're thinking about doing together. So we'll start with one property. Let's say you buy it at 150,000. You might spend 25 on it and you might sell it for say 210, something along those lines. So, you know, walk through scenarios of what happens if God forbid he falls ill, can't finish the renovation works, or he falls over on site and breaks a leg. Okay. What happens there? Are you insured? 
to cover his uh, liability and all the rest of it. What happens if you have to sell it below what you paid for the property? Okay, um, because the market crashes. You know, what happens if you can't sell it, you have to rent it out. Um, there's all these sorts of things, these scenarios that you have to plan in advance for because this is the point where people fall out. Let's say, for example, you get to the end of the project. Uh, he's put the equivalent of £10,000 worth of time and effort into doing the project for you, and he's banking on being paid. You call the estate agents up, they come around, they tell you that they'll sell the property within 12 weeks. Uh, you get them all on board, and you uh, get right to the 11th hour, and then your buyer pulls out for whatever reason, and then you haven't sold the property, and this guy's desperate for money, what then happens, okay? Is he in a position financially to not worry about it? Or does it sound like a really good idea? Um, and actually, the reality is he can't afford to sit around and wait for his money to come in. So those are the sorts of things you want to think about. Um, now, if you're in a position to maybe, you know, pay him a day rate, and then do a profit share, that might actually work out better because he's getting some cash at least, and then he, he'll do a share of profit at the end. Also, some of the things I've seen in these situations, Kenny, is that uh, there, there is a difference of opinion on the finish of the property. And that can be a real challenge because uh, when you're doing a house up for, for yourself to live in, you tend to want to put the best bathroom in and the best kitchen and all the rest of it, right? But when you're doing a property to flip, you probably want to put something in that looks nice and is functional, but you, you probably don't want to spend top end, right? And sometimes uh, I've seen people fall out because uh, one party wants to put a really nice kitchen in and then the other party is like, well, actually, that's a bit too much. It's out of our budget. Oh, well, but we won't be able to sell it if we don't do this. Or they put too much personalization into it. So they do uh, green walls in the kitchen and blue walls in the in the bathroom and it's too bright, it's too austere, the colors are too much uh, and it makes it difficult for the property to sell. Okay, so those are the sorts of things you want to really think about. You need a standard. And if you can go around and look at other properties that are for sale at the moment in your local area, look at what the standard is, agree the standard, maybe go to um, uh, Wix or, you know, B&Q, those sorts of places and, and agree the standard of the kitchen that you're putting in and the standard of the bathroom you're putting in. Those would be a good, uh, be a really, really good place to start. Okay. And then draw it up into some form of in, informal partnership agreement Okay, and then um, you have a mechanism for all of these things that will happen. You have some kind of outcome or next step if such a thing happens. Okay, and you'll never cover a hundred percent of all of these different scenarios. Okay, so you, you never you'll never nail it a hundred percent. But what you are doing is you're putting a framework in place where you can both meet in the middle about what is fair. And I think that's the most important thing to get to if you can both have an understanding of this is what's fair, this is what's not fair, then you'll find that these sorts of projects go uh, a lot better. Uh, the worst ones I see are where, you know, people just end up falling out, and then the property is half finished. And then it's like, well, how do we finish this project? Because, you know, this guy's not turning up to do the work anymore. Uh, I can't afford to put any more money in because, you know, I've run out. And it, you then end up in this very, very contentious situation where you end up falling out. And, then lawyers get involved and God knows what else, which you, you, you want to try and avoid like the plague if you can. Okay. So uh, that's how I would approach it. Do, do that work up front and the partnership will be uh, a lot more plain sailing. If you don't do the work up front and you just go into it thinking everything's going to be rosy, I guarantee things will start to fall apart quite quickly. They'll start to unravel quickly. And then you'll end up in a situation where you'll be banging your head up against the wall, wishing, you know, why did I even start this project in the first place? Uh, it, it happens, unfortunately. It's it's managing people and relationships. I've known uh, investors work with builders for months or years. It actually happened to me where I had a, a builder. He did, I think, seven or eight properties for me, top to bottom refurb jobs. It was uh, almost like a conveyor belt. He knew the standard. He knew what we were doing. Um Great, great work for him. Really, really good income earner for him. And then I bought a, a property for myself, which I lived in for a short period. It was going to be a uh, a holiday let, that sort of thing. And it took him six weeks to renovate a kitchen that was about, oh, I'm just trying to think now, eight foot by eight foot. It was a small kitchen. Um, and we had to take the ceiling down 
and put the new ceiling up and then put new kitchen units in. It was not a complicated job at all. And we ended up having a fallout over that because I was like, why, when you've done three bed properties and have done a complete refurb in terms of new kitchen, new bathroom, replaster, update the electrics, update the plumbing system, uh, fresh coat of paint throughout, new carpets, new doors, all the rest of it. You've done that in four weeks and it's taken you six weeks to do this kitchen. Uh, that ended up in in our relationship breaking down substantially, as you can imagine. So I uh, just want to give you that bit of an insight there, Kenny. Um, wishing you the best of luck. If there's anything we can do, uh, obviously let me know, but um, I'm just going to wish you the best of luck with that. Do one project, see how you get on. Uh, if it works out well, on to the next one. And then hopefully, you know, there's less need for the paperwork, but at least you've got it in place. God forbid your thing go, things go wrong. Okay, good luck with that, Kenny. Uh, wish you the best of luck for Christmas as well. And uh, let me know if we can do anything else to help. Okay, all right, moving on. Question number two has come in from Michael. Uh, Michael says, uh, oh, sorry. Hi there, Michael. Good to uh, see you on a webinar. Thank you for your question. Uh, so Michael says, I've been knocked back on a recent mortgage application, but cannot work out why. Are there any tips you can give me to help uh, make my position more appealing to lenders? And any tips to rebuild my credit just in case it slips somehow? Okay, Michael, well, thank you for that question. Um, great question, because this is something that I don't see many uh, mortgage brokers talking about or, or having knowledge of necessarily with working with their clients to put them in the best position possible for uh, raising finance for a purchase. And it's something we used to teach a lot when I was doing the sort of uh, seminar circuits uh, and speaking for uh, property investor organizations on helping people to rebuild their credit rating because uh, for whatever reason, it had fallen apart or, you know, something negative had happened and all the rest of it. So the quickest ways I can show you how to uh, do this, Michael, or the best advice I can give you, uh, first step would be to write to the credit reference agencies, the three of them, Experian, Equifax, and it used to be called Call Credit, it's now called TransUnion. So you want to write to them. Uh, if you go on their website, you can download a form to order your statutory credit report. OK, now this is different because a lot of these credit reference agencies will try and sell you into a monthly uh, sort of digital access to your credit report. And you can see what changes month on month on month. Initially, I'm not going to encourage you to sign up for that. I'm going to ask you to get your statutory credit report and get it printed in hard copy and sent to your door. OK. Now, as I say, on each of those individual websites, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion, you can download a copy of their uh, form for the statutory credit report, um, and then you'll fill in the form, send it with a, uh, I send it with a cover letter, you, it's up to you how you want to do it, but uh, put a cover letter in there and list the last six years of addresses that you've lived in, along with the dates that you've lived there for, okay, and send that off, and then within seven days, there or thereabouts, you should get a copy of your statutory credit report in from each of those different agencies. Okay. Now, you, depending upon how active you've been financially, that report might be quite thin or it might be quite thick. And what you need to do is to go through that report with a fine tooth comb. And what you're looking for is any errors or omissions within each one of the credit reports. Now, it might be things as simple as you know, a misspelling of your name. Um, it might be uh, an error in your address. For example, um, that you might say, I live at number 12 New Road, and somebody's put down number two New Road or something like that. So what you've got to remember is that every time you make an application for a credit card or a mortgage or any kind of um, financial uh, instrument, for want of a better word, you'll have teams of uh, data inputters that will input data into their systems and then those systems share that data with the credit reference agencies and with the greatest respect to everybody in the world they're probably not that hot on accuracy okay so sometimes there can be misspellings uh errors in information in in that's actually put into the data that they enter into their system that gets shared with the credit reference agency and what they're looking for is consistency so if there's things that are happening where there's inconsistencies showing up in the data and information that's being shared, that will have a negative impact on your credit score, okay? So the, the whole idea is go through it and see if there's anything on your credit report that needs correcting, first and foremost, or 
as is very common, things are appearing on your credit file that are nothing to do with you. So let's say, for example, uh, you moved into a house where the uh, previous owner had bad credit. There could be a knock-on effect where somehow they've been linked to your credit file and then their data is now showing on your credit file. So for example, if, if two people get married, okay, one's got great credit, the other one's got really bad credit. The moment they get married, their credit files tend to get into intertwined, okay? And the bad credit can pull down the great credit, but the uh, um, great credit can pull up the bad credit, okay? So it can be this kind of balancing act, but it can be a problem if somebody's got great credit and they're used to getting everything uh, rubber stamped very, very quickly. It can be a problem then in getting uh, certain finance products in place. So uh, you want to check that there's nothing on your credit file that shouldn't be on there that hasn't appeared from a previous address or a previous partner, or there's been some kind of error uh, in the data entry where something has appeared on your credit file that actually shouldn't be there. And if the, you are noticing that there are errors and omissions or there's stuff that's on there that shouldn't be on there, then you want to write to each different agency, highlight what's gone wrong, and then make them aware that these are the things that need to be changed and altered and brought up to date. Now, that will take a couple of weeks to filter through. It may be that they come back to you and say, can you explain more about this situation? You are allowed to put, I think it's called a notice of correction. Forgive me if I'm wrong on that, but I think it's called a notice of correction. So if there's something that happened, let's say uh, three years ago, you missed a payment on something, you can put, actually, this payment was made, not sure why it's showing as missed. And if, if there are things like that, because that's where your credit file tends to get reduced quite substantially is where uh, there are missed payments or there are payments that uh, haven't been met correctly or they're just not recorded. You've made them on time, but for whatever reason, they're not, they're not uh, recorded properly. Then those are the sorts of things that you need to correct. And if you can provide evidence that says, actually, here's my bank statement that shows on this date, this payment was made. Not sure why it's not showing, but you need to make sure that it is. Um, then get those things updated on your credit file because it's important to build that established credit history okay and that should uh, help you to tidy up over a period of probably let's be realistic it's going to be at least 12 weeks right to help you to tidy up your credit file go back and forth do that process and then make sure that everything is as it should be across those three credit files now the second thing you might want to consider doing michael and you haven't mentioned this in your question but i'm going to mention it because i think it might be useful for anybody watching who might be in a similar position to you is that you might be in a position where you've been knocked back because uh, uh, banks are getting nervous about the level of personal uh, debt that people are carrying right now. Okay. And what you want to do is to put a plan in place to reduce your um, the amount of borrowing. So on a credit file, for example, let's say you've got five credit cards. And for the sake of making math really, really simple, each of those five credit cards has a limit of a thousand pounds. And if you're up to 900 pounds on each of those limits across those five cards, they might look at your credit file and go, mm, actually, this guy's pretty close to his limits across these five cards. Um, is he being sensible with the borrowing that he's got? If that was 50%, or there was one or two cards that had nothing on them whatsoever, then that might look more favorable to lenders as far as uh, your sort of, shall we say, debt to equity ratio. It's not quite like that, but your uh, debt to limit ratio, should I say, is is more favorable. Okay, so you want to look at reducing down the amount of uh, borrowings that you are carrying, because that might be one of the reasons why you got knocked back. And one of the things uh, I have to be very careful when I tell you about this, Michael, because obviously I'm not uh, financially qualified. I'm not giving you any kind of FCA regulated financial advice or anything of that nature. Okay. But uh, what I have noticed people do in these sort of situations, and I've done it myself, is that if you've got, let's say you've got three or four credit cards, if you look at the percentage rate that people pay on credit cards, it's extortion. <laughs> let's not beat about the bush. Okay. You're talking 15, 18, 20, 25%, 30% uh, interest that you're paying on these uh, credit cards. And in fact, I'm told that if you max out the balance of your credit card and you just pay the minimum amount every single month, it will take you 36 years to clear the balance on my credit card. Okay. And, and, and I'm, that's, you're not mishearing things. 36 years 
to repay the balance on that credit card. Okay, so you, what you want to be doing is looking at things like, or what should I, should I say, what I would do in your situation, Michael, is I would um, be looking at doing what's called stoozing. And that is either getting another credit card with a 0% balance and transferring the balance onto that, and then committing to paying down that balance as quickly as possible. The reason why you want 0% is because you're not then paying a fortune to pay the interest on the balance that you're carrying. You're just going to be paying off the balance every single month, right? Uh, and that's what you, where you want to be pitching yourself to do this. You can do this. And what, what a lot of people don't know is you can call your existing credit card companies and negotiate the rate on your card. Okay, so you don't necessarily have to go out and get another card with 0%. You can call your existing lender and, and credit card company and say, um, I'd, like, I'd like 0%, please. Okay, and they'll say, well, you've already had 0%. They say, well, I'd like it again. All right. Oh, uh, I'm not sure we can do that, sir. Well, I'm sure you can because you're doing it for new customers only. Ah, uh, that's for new customers only, sir. So you're discriminating against me then. Uh, 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 well, you are, aren't you? You're discriminating against me because I'm an established customer of yours and you're giving people that have no track record with you a better deal than what you're giving to me. Okay, isn't that discrimination? And what you'll tend to find is that um, they tend to get very concerned about these sorts of conversations, and you may find that they will actually reduce the interest or um, give you a 0% rate for a certain period. But obviously, if you're going to do something like this, Michael, you don't want to be spending more money on your credit cards, okay? The best thing you can do, cut your credit cards up, pay down that that uh, balance, okay, and and not put yourself in a position where you're highly leveraged and you're very close to your limit that you you've got on, on each of those cards. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Um, it's something that I, I I'm quite passionate about because it's one of the things that I think is going to have a massive impact on uh, the market in 2023. Is it's not necessarily the uh, people's mortgages and all the rest of it is actually will be the personal debt that carries people over the edge, I think, in this uh, next economy. So uh, I, that's how I would approach it. If I was in your shoes, if there's anything else I can do to help you out on that, Michael, let me know. Um, have a look online for stoozing. It's quite an interesting subject. We used to do it a lot when we were in the property investor world. Um, it, it's great if you're very good at managing your finances. If you're one of these people that likes to spend then it's I don't encourage this at all. I encourage you to cut your credit cards up and uh, work out a plan to get rid of that uh, consumer debt as much as possible. If you're going to be sensible and use it for the right sort of reasons, then it can be a really useful um, what I'm is it be a really useful source of funds for different projects, but you have to manage it so, 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 so carefully. And as I say, many people get themselves into difficulty when they don't manage it effectively. Okay, so best of luck with that. Best of luck with that, Michael. Hope it all works out for you. Anything else we can do to help? Let me know. Uh, otherwise, have a fabulous Christmas and look forward to hearing from you again in the future. Okay, question number three comes in from Nils. Uh, hi there, Nils. Thank you for your question. Uh, so Nils says, uh, "Me and my girlfriend are first-time buyers. Uh, I'm putting fifty thousand towards the deposit, uh, whilst she can only afford twelve thousand. Uh, to be fair to each other, we've." Uh, we've also agreed to split all expenses 65 35 as i'm also the biggest earner we're not looking to get married anytime soon and have no kids her father has suggested that even though our contributions are different the property ownership should be split 50 50 we're going to be tenants in common her father said that should we split up it might cause problems as these things can get bitter would we both be entitled to our initial deposits uh, as i uh, and is it fair to think if I have paid the most and will be contributing the most that I should get a bigger share of the sale if we end up selling? Okay, great question there, Nils. Thanks for that. Um, I really appreciate what, you, what, you, what you're saying there. And this is quite common in a lot of situations where two people come together and there's different financial uh, firepower, if you like, as far as they're concerned coming into the relationship either, as you put it, a bigger deposit or bigger uh, earning power or both. And the way I would approach it as far as you're concerned is go into this whole thing eyes wide open, similar to what I was saying to uh, the first question here that came in from uh, Kenny about having things in writing. It's absolutely vital. If you're going into 
uh, a relationship where you're not married, you're going to be cohabiting, you're buying a property together. Um, as Judge Judy would say, you're you're playing, uh, you're playing couples. Okay, you're playing as a married couple. That's her way of looking at things. Um, but the way to look at it is, you're going into this eyes wide open. You need to have everything in writing of what you're agreeing to, so that, God forbid, if things do fall apart, you've got something you can refer back to that stops all the arguments, that stops all the bitterness, that says, okay, this is what we agreed going into this. This is what how we're going to exit this whole thing on the back end. And it, you you want to look at it from a point of view that if you're putting the majority of the money in up front, if it was fair in terms of running the monthly household bills and you were both contributing the same, then it would seem fair that if you just took your deposits back initially and then whatever equity growth was in the um property over the time of ownership if you split that 50 50 that would seem a fair way to approach things right but you know it sounds to me as though there's going to be a, a very different approach as far as the monthly running of the property is concerned um and I would be careful to make sure that was agreed in writing and done up front because it, it could get difficult, as you say, if things start to fall apart and things start to get um, uh, a little bit more, shall we say, agitated, particularly if there's more people involved, like, for example, uh, what would be your father-in-law if you, if you got uh, married, there would be potentially additional pressure uh, that could come to bear in that sort of a situation. Now, I want to give you a bit of an example because this happened to a friend of mine many years ago. And uh, he was a wonderful, wonderful guy. L love him to bits. Um, I won't mention who it is, um, but he'll know when, it, you know when I tell the story. But what happened was him and his partner bought a property uh, in the Northeast. They had uh, been to living together for about three years, I think, in one property. Uh, they sold that. They then upgraded to a bigger property. And it needed quite a lot of work doing to it. So uh, what they agreed was that her father would do uh, a lot of the renovation works to the property. And I think, off the top of my head, I think he quoted something like £23,000 to do the renovation works, right? That was all agreed. Uh, he got on with the work. And then about two-thirds of the way through the job, he said, yeah, it's actually going to be more like 34000 And I'm like, okay, that's a major jump. And this was at a time when their relationship was starting to break down. It was starting to get a little bit contentious. And uh, he actually invited us up to have a look at the property. And I, at the time, I was just qualifying as a surveyor. And I'm looking around this house and going, okay, uh, there was a dwarf wall where the, in the kitchen where some of the units backed up to. And I sort of leant against this wall. And I, I kid you not, it started rocking. And I was like, oh, my goodness, like this is not good. And that, uh, he, got, <laughs> he got these French doors that opened out onto the garden, right? And I said... Who, who fitted these doors? And uh, he laughingly said uh, it was um, it was a blind guy, meaning uh, the father-in-law was also a blind fitter. Uh, but the way he said it, it was just like it was a blind guy. And I looked at him like, I'm not surprised because the hinges were buried about uh, um, three quarters of an inch into the timber frames. And I was like, what on earth has been going on here? It was just a, it was just a mess, basically. And I just thought, why would you be spending your hard-earned cash on employing a cowboy builder, even if it is your at what would be your father-in-law and that relationship ended up going south and uh and they, they ended up splitting up now i wasn't privy to what the financial arrangement was going in and i wasn't privy to the financial arrangement coming out but what i can tell you is that having stuff in writing uh definitely eases the burden when it comes to uh the emotional side of things when, when there's a parting of company between those between the two of you because at the moment you're getting on well the relationship's going well by the sounds of things it must be because you're thinking about getting a house together right so have that conversation god forbid this happens we decide to split up how are we going to handle it i think it's fair that i'm putting fifty thousand into this property that i get at least that fifty thousand pounds back you know you might want to capitulate on the fact that you're going 65 35 on the bills um that you then decide to, uh, you know, take 50-50 on the equity, she's getting a 15% gain on any equity over the course of the next three, five, 10 years, however long you guys are together. And God forbid you don't, you don't end up selling. 
this is just a precautionary measure but it's sensible and if you're meeting resistance having that conversation and documenting things in writing it might be a red flag for other things that might unfold in the relationship in the future okay obviously i don't know you both i don't know all of the scenarios that uh, are around you both but the, there's other things as i say that will potentially influence this such as what happens if you know one of you runs up a load of credit card debt or what happens if uh, one of you doesn't make your payments on your credit cards or your car payments or whatever else it might be who's on the hook for what payments who's on the hook for the mortgage god forbid one of you loses your job what then what then what then okay so having that conversation yes it's difficult and yes you have to go at it with cool and rational heads but it's far better to do it up front when the relationship is sound than trying to negotiate it on the back end when you know things are really uncertain and of course the other thing is that you know if you're buying a property now and the market dips 20 percent you both you both might be out of pocket because the property might be in negative equity. I don't I don't know. You know, I'm just throwing that out there as an idea. These are the sorts of things that you need to think about and you need to have those conversations with. Um, I had another friend actually who bought a property with his partner, and they uh, this was before the last credit crunch. This was about 2006, I think it was, uh, and they got 125 percent mortgage on the property. Okay, it, it was shocking, but they were going to build this extension on the side, and then again, him and his partner ended up splitting up. I don't know all of the ins and outs of that financial situation, but you can understand that if there's no equity in the property, it probably makes the decision to split a lot easier. But also don't forget that somebody's on the hook for all of that level of debt, right? So you need to have that honest and frank and open conversation. And if you, if you want more uh, ideas of what to include in that conversation, then just let me know. I'm more than happy to throw a few more questions at you, Niels. But I think have, have it up front, get it in writing, agree it between the two of you, then you can at least show that you've had that honest conversation with your uh, father-in-law. That might just give him a bit more peace of mind as to you know the fact that you're both being adults and you're going into this thing eyes wide open. And then it's just down to the both of you to work at the relationship and uh, make sure that it uh, unfolds the way you want it to. Okay, so best of luck with that, Nils. Uh, as I say, anything else we can do to help, let me know. Uh, otherwise, good luck and have a great Christmas. So question number four comes in from Kerry. Hi there, Kerry. Thank you for your question and for being part of our amazing WiggyWan community. Uh, Kerry asks, what are the benefits of the current market for a first-time buyer, if any? Okay, Kerry, well, nice and short and sweet, that one. Wonderful. Um, from, from a point of view of being a first-time buyer in the, in the market at the moment, Kerry, uh, I think the main benefit probably comes down to two things, okay? One is more availability of choice than there has been perhaps in the last couple of years because more properties will begin to come on the market than ever before. Uh, and as a consequence, you've got a wider choice if you're prepared to sort of sit and wait for a little bit than you would have had in the last two years when people were getting desperate for a property and they felt that they were never going to be able to buy anything unless they overpaid. So you're going to have more choice. And as a, as a consequence of more choice and a slower market, which I believe will be the case in 2023, you'll also be able to buy better okay so rather than being forced into a position where you've got to pay over the asking price or whatever else it might be uh, the price is escalating away from you actually the price can be set by your parameters which is do you know what i'm one of only one other buyer in the marketplace um this is where the property works for me this is what i'm prepared to offer and then you can uh make an offer which is sensible and more importantly affordable now what i think is going to happen for a few people is that there's going to be a number of difficulties in raising finance uh, to uh, buy a property. Okay. And that will obviously affect how much property sell for. And this is one of the biggest things that I don't think people are necessarily prepared for in the current marketplace is that what, what will probably happen if you want my prediction over the course of the next uh, six to 12 months, there's going to be a lag in the in the market and what will happen over the course of the next three months shall we say as we head towards the spring market the people that have put their house on the market recently will likely be reflecting on the fact that this is a lull okay this is a lull in the market the market's got a little bit overexcited um there's actually a great scene in the big short it's you know there's a, a real realtor she's driving people around to look at properties and she says oh the market's in a little bit of a gully right now 
Okay, and this is not to offend estate agents in any way, shape, or form. Obviously, you, you know, estate agents, their job is to get the best possible price for a property on behalf of their clients. But the, the key point here is when the market enters this little bit of a lull, sellers will sit on their hands in the expectation that a buyer will show up. Okay, and what it requires is, unfortunately, and I'm going to be very frank here, Kerry, what it requires for a lot of sellers is to go through that period of nobody showing up for a viewing or very few people showing up for a viewing and then no offers coming in or lower offers than their asking price being tabled. And that causes the seller to think because the psychology of most sellers is they put the property up for sale. They're expecting it to sell overnight. They're expecting it to sell for more than it's on the market for or in some cases, uh, but they're certainly expecting it to sell quickly. And when it doesn't, that's when the pain starts to set in and they start to change the thinking, okay, so what's wrong? What's going on? Why is this property not selling? Um, and it requires that uh, lack of momentum, lack of interest, lack of uh, offers on the table in order for the seller's thinking to start changing in order for them to go, actually, we might need to reduce the price. And they'll have conversations with their estate agent and their estate agent will say, yeah, well, we tried it at this level. It didn't work. We haven't got the interest. Let's drop it up by 10,000, 15,000, whatever it might be. And of course, the, the biggest thing to bear in mind, Kerry, as a first time buyer, is the lower the uh, purchase price that you can pay for that property, the lower your commitment to a 25 year plus mortgage on that property. Okay, so if you were lucky and you got a property 50,000 pounds less than it was on the market for, or £50,000 less than what it's worth in some cases as property investors are fairly used to doing, just think about the difference that makes in terms of the amount that you have to borrow to buy that property. Okay, it's huge. And it makes a massive difference to what you're committing to in terms of taking on a 25-year mortgage and then making payments on that every single month because actually you're reducing down the amount of debt you're taking on in the first place, you're reducing the amount of your monthly payment, and that can put you in a really strong position financially, okay, over the long term. So that's where I, I get would, would get quite excited if I was in your position, Kerry, as a first-time buyer going to the marketplace. You're going to have more choice. You're going to be able to buy better, so probably either a better quality property than you perhaps would have been able to afford uh, or paying less for that same property now than you probably would have done two years ago, okay, or certainly, certainly 12 months ago. So there's going to be a lot more choice, um, better deals, and if you're patient, I think, you know, it could you, you could be – looking onto the right property, one perhaps that you didn't think you might be able to afford uh, because you waited around and you're in a good position to buy. And this is all predicated on the fact, of course, that you know we don't end up in another credit crunch situation, which could see prices drop dramatic, dr drastically. And um, the one question mark, of course, there is a lot of funny business going on in the banking industry right now. Uh, if a bank falls over, then very quickly we could end up in another credit crunch situation where the market virtually stops overnight. And I don't, I, I, don't, I hope that doesn't happen. Obviously, of course, I, I don't want people to lose value on the, on the properties that they've got. But we also have to face facts that look at how unaffordable things are becoming. Inflation is running away. We've got people striking across the country because they can't afford to buy food. We've got an increase in food banks and, and all the rest of it. So times are tough for people right now. We have to face that reality. And that unfortunately means over the short to medium term, prices have to come down in order to meet affordability because wages aren't going up. Okay, so hope that answers the question well for you, Kerry. Uh, obviously, if there's anything else we can do from our side uh, to help you out, then please just let me know. Um, but I wish you all the best of luck with that and uh, have a great Christmas as well. All right. So moving on, uh, question uh, number five comes in from Arnie. Uh, Arnie says, my wife and I, are considering going into buy to let, but with all the new legislation coming in, is it worth the hassle? Also, are there any laws in place to protect landlords if a tenant refuses to pay? Uh, I've watched a show on TV and this seems to be a common problem. We've been given details from a friend for a good letting agent who will take care of everything for us if we go ahead. Would you say it is still a good investment opportunity? Okay, Arnie, thank you for your question. Uh, really appreciate you also being part of our Wiggy Worm community here and um, for sending that question in. It's, it's an interesting one to play around with at the moment with uh, buy to let because if you read a lot of the forums, 
uh, online uh, of people that are, are in the investment world and have been landlords, particularly the ones that have been in the market for a long time, uh, a lot of them are getting fed up with the uh, what seems to be a constant onslaught uh, of um, legislation changes against landlords and the impact that is having on their business and the, the amount of costs that they're um, now attracting into their business and also the issues around what they're able to deduct against their monthly income. And one of the things they're not allowed to deduct anymore, of course, is the um, uh, cost of the monthly mortgage unless the property is held in a limited company. And that can also have impacts in terms of uh, ownership of the property, how easy it is to transfer ownership to another party, how much deposit you have to put down in order to buy that particular property, and then, how, of course, how you get your profits out of that company and into your own pocket. So the, there is uh, a lot of pros and cons involved in all of this. If it, the, the, the answer I would give you on this one, Arnie, is it depends on your personal financial situation. At the moment, uh, and, and this has probably been the case for the last, I don't know, 60, 80, 100 years, is that the uh, landlord-tenant legislation and scenarios tends to go through a bit of a cycle where sometimes legislation is in the tenant's favour, then it's in the landlord's favour, and it kind of swings back and forth between the two. The issue that I think the, the government are going to have very soon is finding enough properties for tenants to go into because uh, a lot of landlords are getting out of the game, which is causing this contraction in the number of properties that are available, which means the, um, the the monthly rent that tenants are having to pay is going up because there's you know less supply, more demand. That forces prices one way, of course. So the opportunity is actually quite good if you look at the numbers. If you're a cash buyer, I would suggest. Um, if you're in a position where you happen to borrow to make this work, then it needs a little bit more thought as to what you're actually uh, financially going to gain because a lot of people get into buy to let with the misnomer that the property market doubles every seven to 10 years. And that's not always the case. Yes, over the long term, the market has gone up. But if you look at um, what happened in 2007, 2008, for example, the market dropped like 20% in certain areas or maybe more. And so if you're buying in 2007 and then the property market drops off a cliff in the following year, well, what, where does that leave you? You know, so these are the sorts of questions that you need to ask yourself. What happens if something untoward happens that I'm not prepared for, uh, I'm not ready for? What will I actually be allowed to deduct against my income? That's a conversation to have with an accountant who knows your personal financial situation, because I don't know whether you're both earning independently, whether you're both retired, whether you are in a position to uh, have other people come in as a consortium, perhaps, and invest in buying property together. These are all sorts of things that can go on to maybe make your uh, investing journey a little bit more advantageous. You, what you might want to consider is buying a property, doing it up and selling it, okay? And both of you using your capital gains tax allowance that you get every single year to deduct against the cost of the, uh, sorry, against the profit that you've made on the property uh, and therefore, you know, pocketing extra cash every single year as a result of doing that. Obviously, if you're going to buy now, if the market drops by 20%, again, are you going to recover your investment? These are the sorts of things that you need to think about and buy well. My honest advice on it, if you're going to go into buy to let, you need to think very carefully about it all. But not only that, get some investment education behind you. I can recommend a number of different sources across the UK uh, where people can help you with this. There are it is one of those industries, unfortunately, where there's a lot of sharks involved and a lot of charlatans, which is one of the reasons why I got out of the industry, because I couldn't stand that people were being parted with their life savings and they weren't getting what they thought they were investing into. OK, thankfully, that was not through the organizations that I was tied with, but there were other uh, players in the in the same industry, unfortunately, who were letting people down substantially. So you need to be very, very careful. Um, are there laws in place to protect uh, the landlords if a tenant refuses to pay? Well, yes, there are, uh, but you have to go through the process of, of evicting the tenant, um, and that can be time-consuming. It can be costly. It can involve court visits and God knows what else. And as I say, at the moment, the, landlord, the legislation is in favour of the tenant more so than the landlord at the moment. So you want to work alongside a very good letting agent. Uh, if you've got details of one from a friend, I would say definitely use them, get involved with them, 
work alongside them and they will help and support you through the journey and they'll be able to handle most of that other work for you so that you're not left in the lurch of having to deal with it as well okay uh it is a common problem perhaps in certain areas where tenants won't pay there are other areas where you know i've had uh, tenants in a, in a property for five six seven ten years and they've been no problem they paid the rent on time every single month and they've lived in it and treated it as their own home because it is okay so there's a lot of pros that there's a, there are some cons those cons are getting greater at the moment it is a balancing act uh would i what would i do if i was going back into it uh, I would change my strategy big time. If I was going back into investing Arnie, uh, I would flip more properties first, which means buy it, do it up and sell it, buy it, do it up and sell it. Or if you're really smart, do it up and sell it without buying it. But that's a conversation for another day. Uh, so yeah, I would flip more and bank more cash rather than uh, buying well and then uh, refinancing and, and then renting it out. Okay, that, that would be the, the one thing I would do differently. Um, you can explore a couple of those options. And again, if you want more uh, in-depth conversation around that, Arnie, uh, we have uh, a number of videos actually within the Wiggy One platform that you can access, which will give you a bit of a background in uh, property investment in terms of finding the right property, uh, what you need to be looking for, how to make it work for you, and, and all the rest of it. Uh, and those videos are free. All you need to do is go to wiggywam.co.uk and uh, sign up to get one of your uh, get a, a free profile there and if you look at the um, uh, learning center on the website there you'll be able to access all of those different training videos which will guide you through uh, how to get started in property and as I say if you need some more resources if you want to mentor or you want uh, somebody else to hold your hand I've got some very good friends still in the industry uh, who will be uh, delighted to help you out and give you all of the up-to-date information on how best to go about building a portfolio all right. So hope that helps, Arnie. Uh, thank you so much indeed for your question. Hope you have a wonderful Christmas as well. And look forward to hearing from you again in the future. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, that draws our webinar to a close today. Thank you so much again for all of your questions and for joining in and for your incredible support over the course of the last, uh, well, I suppose 90 days or so that we've been running these um, webinars. It's really wonderful to be able to sort of share some uh, help and support and advice for the various different people and uh, help you along with your property journey because I know how uh, daunting and complicated it can seem when you're getting uh, first started getting into property uh, and I remember one of the most humbling experiences for me was uh, I think it was 2006 when I'd spent a number of years in the property industry as an estate agent and also trained to become a surveyor and I went to my very first property investment education uh, seminar right and I was like, yeah, it's dead easy to make money in property, right? This is all you need to do, buy it, do it up and sell it. And I got introduced to this entirely different world of uh, not only just personal development education, but also different strategies, techniques, and uh, tools that you can use to build a property portfolio that nobody had ever showed me before. And I was like, oh my goodness. And that was, as I say, one of the start of my um, journey to realizing how much I don't know as an individual. And yeah, it's been really interesting to change my life since 2006 to uh, become more wide, widely read and more studying of realizing that I don't know uh, virtually <laughs> anything as far as this world is concerned. There is so much to learn, so much to understand, so much to get our heads around. Um, but that, as I say, has led me on this journey of learning a huge amount of stuff, which I'm now able to share with as many people as possible through these webinars and through these uh, questions that we send out every week to people. And so I greatly appreciate every single one of you uh, for being part of our Wiggy Web community, for submitting your questions each week, for taking the time to watch our webinars, and also to share uh, these questions and these webinars with your friends and family. Uh, it really does help us to reach more and more people. There's some incredibly exciting things coming in 2023 as far as Wiggy Web is concerned. So I hope you'll join us on that journey. Uh, please, please, please uh, do... Uh, submit your questions we are going to continue running these webinars throughout uh we're going to do one between christmas and new year and then we're going to launch into 2023 with uh, a lot more uh on the webinar content side of things so any questions concerns comments that you have uh, please send them through to us happy to help at wiggywam.co.uk that's happy to help at wiggywam.co.uk uh, you can also submit information to us via our website which is uh, wiggywam.co.uk that's wiggywam.co.uk or you can uh, find us on Twitter, which is um, at WiggyWam underscore UK, at WiggyWam underscore UK. And uh, again, submit any questions, comments, feedback to that. 
feel free to consider sharing this with your friends and family so that we can uh, expand our reach and, and reach more people. And if there's anything that we can do to help you with your property journey, please do let me know. Um, final mention to our £50,000 Christmas giveaway. If you want to take part in that, just shoot me an email. Happy to help at wiggywem.co.uk with the subject line Christmas giveaway. That's happy to help at wiggywem.co.uk with the subject line Christmas giveaway. And uh, I would look forward to welcoming you into our 12-week roadmap journey in um, the new year, which will help you get at least 20% additional revenue in your business or build you up to be a superstar player if you're an individual working for a company and you want to take part in that as well. So we're doing our bit to try and help you guys and girls. Uh, wishing you all the very best for Christmas, whatever it is you decide to do. Hope you have an amazing time. Uh, hope it is the Christmas that you uh, want and it's a, a nice time to reflect and take some time for you and uh, just uh, reflect on, on the year that's gone and the one that's coming and may it bring you all that you wish for for yourself and others. All right. Looking forward to it, guys and girls. Thank you so much indeed. Have a lovely Christmas and uh, New Year and I will see you very soon. You take care. Bye-bye.